Well, good morning, and uh, it is good to be with you today, and what a great time of worship and song to start the day. So before we get started, you know, any time that I would ever doubt that the Lord has a plan and a purpose, he'll always say, yes, I do, don't worry, because if you guys were not in our small group time today with Ken, I started thinking as Ken was teaching, wow, this really kind of overlaps and speaks to a lot of what we're going to talk about today, and it just helped me feel confident because it's confirmation that the Lord uh, keeps us tracking together. And Ken didn't know what I was going to preach on. I didn't know what he was teaching on. So uh, just one of those little, you know, God shots, I guess you could call it, where we see that the Lord continues to work among his people. I do want to say today before we get started, uh, I have really been in prayer a lot for the Lord to lead how this message will be delivered. Um, It's possible that some people may feel encouraged by it, it's possible that other people may be challenged by it. I just want to say, whatever it is that the Lord is leading you into, be mindful of that, be attentive to it, and just speak with the Holy Spirit about how He would have you receive it, take it in. Uh, Nothing I ever say is meant to be heavy-handed. I am one, though, who feels we should not shy away from difficult truths of Scripture, and sometimes what can be called hard teachings of Jesus. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, My heart is to love everyone here in a way that is obedient to Christ. So today we're going to be talking about this aspect of love not the world, the danger of falling away in shipwrecked faith. So we're going to look at a couple of passages here real quick. All right, so 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And in 2 Timothy, he writes this, Do your best to come to me soon, for Damos, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So I just want to pray real quick before we continue. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word being able to be read freely here. I just pray that as we continue forward, that it will be your word spoken, your truth revealed, that you will be magnified and glorified, and that we will be uh, reminded of what it means to be obedient and accountable to you according to your word and to your spirit. And these things I ask in your name. Amen. So we might start to ask the question, what is the love of the world? Or what does it mean to be in love with the world? What may cause a believer to let go of their faith and a strong conscience? Well, we get a little bit of an insight into this when we look at John. So this is what John writes. Do not love the world or the things in or that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires or lust of the flesh, and the desires or lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Some translations in the first part might say, the things the world offers you or the world's goods. I think those are two things to keep in mind as we're talking through uh, the message today. And also, the message version says the love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. And then for verse 16, the message says this, practically everything that goes on in the world, warning your own way, warning everything for yourself, warning to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father, it just isolates you from Him. And I think that's a really good way to think about that scripture, is that the world tries to isolate us from our Heavenly Father. You see, we live in a challenging time today. Christians always have, but with the continued rise of technology, and specifically social media, every idea and thought of mankind is available immediately often without context, without the time to critically think through the implications of ideas. This issue has only escalated post-COVID 
as more people than ever are seeking connection to and information from people they've never met with no true knowledge of the person on the other side of the keyboard or screen except what they filter for social media and public presentation. So there's a great danger here for God's people. Without an intentional awareness and a critical eye toward what is fed through our screens and our other information mediums, believers are just as susceptible to the world's influence as the unsaved. Many professed believers today are seemingly being drawn off course from obedience to Christ and coming into alignment with the world's ways and are happily traveling down the wide road that leads away from Christ and his kingdom. And it's not just social media news and other electronic connection points that are problematic. It's our human nature by design to seek connection to others. But the world apart from Christ is so desperate to find their place and feel accepted that now almost anything the human mind can conjure is pushed and promoted for acceptance. Every lifestyle, every ideology, every worldview except godliness. And many professing Christians today, especially our young people and children, are being deceived by peers espousing these things that are completely antithetical to holy living in the kingdom of God. John Piper once said this, maybe, yes, love for God and love for the world cannot coexist. And I don't mean that, and I don't think he means that in a way of not caring for the world, but in giving our allegiance to the world and in coming into alignment with the world, right? It means in what we allow to be the driver of our actions. Because you see, Scripture tells us we can't serve two masters. Because we will love one and hate the other. There can't be multiple objects of our affection and attention. And we can't lay our first fruits or our best and highest on more than one altar. That's impossible. You see, the same considerations that Paul put to the Corinthian believers are just as much applicable for us today when he said this, For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? I want you to think of it this way. Whatever you and I do, we carry Christ into that with us. We would do well not to grieve the Holy Spirit by participation and partnership with ungodliness. John Cooper, who some of you may know, is the lead singer of a band called Skillet. This is what he said recently as a podcast I was listening to. He said, worship is what you value supremely. What is it that you value, love, or adore the most that you can't live without? That is supposed to be aimed at Christ. To worship falsely means God is out of that position and anything else is in that. Because you see, as believers, we have to consider how do we need to intentionally consider the way we approach living in the world but not of it? How can we be purposeful in the way that we live so as to avoid a shipwrecked faith where we no longer hold biblical faith and a good conscience for the things of God? So here are the things we're going to consider today. One, we need to remember, be confident in Christ, not ourselves. We need to be mindful not to take our Christian experience and knowledge for granted. We need to remember, we don't puff ourselves up and think that we have it all together and can put our Christian walk on cruise control. Don't think that in and of ourselves we are beyond the influence of the world system. Don't let our guard down when we are surrounded by worldly people and think we can avoid ungodly actions and mindsets just because we're a Christian. We were talking today in a small group about the armor of God. It's a perfect reminder of the need to always be mindful and watchful and to take what the Lord gives us as our defense. Because you see, we should expect, there's a guy named Lucas Miles, I heard this and I thought this was an excellent thing to remind us of. 
we should expect a pagan world to respond the way paganism leans. And scripture tells us to expect that. Scripture tells us we should not be surprised when the pagan world, when the lost world acts the way it does. Because we see the world, society, and culture acting a certain way, we should automatically pause and seek wisdom and discernment according to the Holy Spirit and his revealing of the truth from God's word. So we talk about the world system. So the world system equals the system that oversees, orders, and governs mankind in its fallen state. A brother from the early part of the 1900s said this, his name was Watchman Nee. Behind all that is tangible, we meet something intangible. We meet a planned system, and in this system there is a harmonious functioning, a perfect order. There is an ordered system, the world, which is governed from behind the scenes by a ruler, Satan. If we consider especially Paul's words about Damos, we don't have a lot about him in Scripture. We have that warning that he fell away and abandoned Paul. But just about six years earlier, he wrote these things about Damos. He writes in Philemon and Colossians, he writes these passages, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow worker. And then he writes to the Colossians, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Damos. So six years prior to Paul writing, that he had fallen away because of his love for the world, Paul was saying he was a co-worker in the faith. So what could make him go, not just from being a believer, but a co-worker in the faith to falling away and loving the world? And I think that perhaps there's a danger he didn't keep these things in mind about his confidence being in Christ. Maybe He thought too highly of his own ability to withstand the pull of the world. So within six years, he has abandoned the faith and gone back to the world's ways. You see, this danger awaits all who forget our need to rely on the power of Christ dwelling in us. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, God wants a people who are 100% surrendered to him in all things and at all times. Secondly, we need to remember, never underestimate the flesh. A perfect example that came to mind was if any, we have any Lord of the Rings fans, there's a scene in the first movie where Gandalf is giving the ring to Frodo. And he says this, Always remember, Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. And we're talking today, again, a small group. There's a lot of crossover. I'm telling you, it's good stuff. Come at nine. Ken's teaching for the next few weeks at least. I know we're going good places. But though we are redeemed in spirit, That spirit still resides in a fallen flesh. And that flesh is attached to the world system. And that world system has a master, and his name is Satan. And just like the ring always wants to be found by its master, our flesh will as well. In Galatians 5, 17 through 21, Paul writes this, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I want you to think about our culture today, not just in America, but in the world. 
How many of these things do we see being celebrated and exalted? Music, movies, video games, social media posts are rampant with pushing sexually explicit ideology, sinful gender ideology, living life based on individual truth, and not just on adults, but with a specific focus on children. Witchcraft and the occult are once again not only increasing in popularity, but are being given platforms from which to influence people of all ages. Socially, we are at odds with one another in ways that most of us have never seen. Jealousy and strife among and between all manner of people groups is rising exponentially. If we as God's people get pulled into this so that our minds and hearts are consumed with these thoughts and ideas, then how can we stand apart as examples of a people who do not live this way because we belong to another kingdom? We've just been studying through the first quarter of the year in our small group about new life. And that new life is based on the reality of our citizenship in the kingdom of God. And scripture tells us that when the spirit comes into our hearts to indwell us, he transfers us to a new kingdom. So that as believers, our new reality has no attachment to the world anymore, but our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our allegiance should lie. That's where all that we do should come from. So if we come into alignment, support, and promotion of these ideologies, then how can Jesus Christ truly be our first love? How can we pursue life of the flesh or be encouragers of those who do when it's opposed to the life of the Spirit of God? Scripture teaches us the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit The desires of what the Spirit wants are against the flesh. They are opposed to one another. There's no amount of human wanting that can make that truth different. So if we want to think about... Yes. To help us understand and think about the context, the desires or lust of the flesh and the eyes, what are these things? We could think of the desires of the lust and the flesh and the eyes as the sinful desire to possess what we see or to have those things which have visual appeal. We could think of it as selfish, uncontrolled cravings of the body. Materialism, greed, you see it, you want it. Consumerism, covetousness, which is the equivalent of idolatry. And as we're talking about these, you guys can fill in the blanks on a lot of things I'm sure that you might be thinking of that apply. We think about the pride of life. It's anything that is of the world, meaning anything that leads to arrogance, ostentation, pride in self, presumption, and boasting. Anything that exalts us above our station and offers the illusion of God-like qualities wherein we boast in arrogance and worldly wisdom. Boastful, the grab for worldly power and ambition. What's interesting is these same three things that John lists were present at the fall when Eve took the apple. You see, there's a common tactic that the enemy uses to try to take those who God wants to work through and live according to his plan and purpose and get them off course. Because it says in Genesis that Eve saw the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and pleasing to the eye, the lust of the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. The pride of life. A.W. Tozer, who is a favorite author, I think he has some great insights. This is what he speaks. He says, in his unredeemed condition, man has lost the way and cannot clearly define the object of his wistful adoration. And so his search takes him far from God. When he does not find God, 
Man will fill the void in his heart with anything he can find. That which is not God can never satiate the heart exclusively created for God's presence. See, everything that is not from God and for God will one day lose its luster. The satisfaction we may gain for a little while when we seek after these things in the worldly way, they will wane. And the void thought to be filled will be revealed once more. I think we see that being played out in our society today. People chase after things that they think will satisfy them. And one day, when it's revealed that it doesn't satisfy them, and it will, they're lost. And they're seeking for something else. And they're disheartened. And they're saddened. And unfortunately, because so many are under the influence of the God of this world, they still don't look to the only one and the only place that can fill that void that they have. So if we as believers are chasing after the desires of the flesh, then we're in danger of making God the object of our disappointment when things go wrong rather than realizing we have lost sight of truth, real, objective, absolute, moral truth. This is only found in God through Jesus Christ. I think this is a uh, a phrase that I heard from a gentleman named Dr. Michael Brown. He has a tremendous podcast that I would strongly encourage if you guys are interested in how to navigate some of our cultural challenges today it's called in the line of fire but he uses this phrase reach out but resist reach out to those around us who are living according to the world system but resist their agendas Paul writes to Timothy he says but understand this that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self lovers of money proud arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Now I know none of us think That's happening in society. I know that when we look around, we don't see any of those things happening, do we? No, the reality is every single one of those things is happening. Every single one of those things is in the culture today. And unfortunately, it's even inside God's people. Sometimes in how the church lives among itself and how its members live their lives. James writes this when he's talking about a warning against worldliness. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Why, if we've given our life to Christ, which by its nature says we've surrendered everything to him and he is Lord... He is in charge of our lives. Would we then want to live in a manner that makes us live and act like an enemy of the cross of Christ? I thought as uh, Dr. Brown shared this quote, and I want to read something he said, but he shared this quote. He said, Opposition. It is a bad sign for Christianity of this day that it provokes so little opposition. If there were no other evidence of it being wrong, I should know from that. When the church and the world can jog along together comfortably, you may be sure there is something wrong. The world has not altered. Its spirit is exactly the same as it ever was. And if Christians were equally faithful and devoted to the Lord and separated from the world, living so their lives were a reproof to all ungodliness, the world would hate them as much as it ever did. It is the church that is altered, not 
the world. And he goes on to say, in short, if we're not experiencing opposition because of our faith, it is a sign we are doing something wrong, or put another way, not doing something right. It's one thing to suffer for our foolishness, obnoxiousness, hypocrisy, or self-righteousness. That is shameful and brings reproach to the gospel. And I 100% agree. Because even when we are standing against the world, we still have to do so in a manner that shows the love of God, that shows that we still care for people, that the way we act doesn't bring reproach to the gospel by being belligerent, by being intentionally combative. That's not what we're called to do. But he says it's another thing to suffer for the gospel. That is a good sign and a reason for rejoicing. See, we may find it difficult to navigate interacting with the unsaved because to stand firm in the objective, unchanging truth according to Scripture and not budge on what is morally right according to the Lord because doing so means that people may say not so nice things about us. They may call us names and say we're not being very loving. They may say we're harming them because we, don't, we won't agree that what they're doing is okay. But our... <clears throat> R.C. Sproul, we're not right there yet, jumped it. But R.C. Sproul said this, the holiness of God is traumatic to unholy people. Remember, Scripture tells us the things of God are foolishness to those who don't know God. They're going to look at the things that we claim are right according to God and His nature and His design and they're going to think we're foolish. They're going to think we're ridiculous. They're going to think that we're not loving simply because we hold to a truth. Corey Cooper, the wife of John Cooper, said this. You can't expect accolades from people who love death and just don't know they do. One thing about most of those who have not accepted Jesus Christ, most of them don't really know that they are lost from what can ultimately bring them redemption and salvation. So many think that what they see in the world is the way it is. We sort of talked about in small group over the last few weeks about different worldviews. And I'll tell you what's sad, and we all need to keep in mind, as we consider this, is how many people who are teachers, preachers, influencers, claiming Christ, espouse ideas that are not biblical. You know, there's a study that Barna did, and it's even about 10 years old now, that over 30% of evangelical pastors, so we'd be considered evangelical, over 30% of evangelical pastors don't hold a biblical worldview. They hold a worldview that's what we call synchristic, which means it incorporates not just biblical ideas, but worldly ideas such as postmodernism, secularism, Marxism, all these different things. And they are espousing these ideas. So I encourage us all, be mindful of who we listen to and who influences us. Be mindful of the voices that you let speak into your life as a believer. Just because somebody has the label Christian doesn't mean the message they're giving us is going to keep us walking according to God's ways. Never, never may we abdicate our spiritual responsibility to somebody else. As we were talking today, it's important. Part of the way that we can stand firm is to be in God's Word, to read God's Word, to understand the Holy Spirit is the one who instructs us and teaches us truth according to God's Word. Everybody familiar with the name Jezebel? If you don't read the Old Testament much, it may sound familiar, but you may not really think about the context. So, if you go back and read 1 Kings... One of the worst kings 
In the history of Israel was a man named Ahab. Scripture tells us that he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all were her, who were before him. And he marries Jezebel, who is a Sidonian. And she brings into Israel Baal worship and Asherah worship. You may remember reading Asherah poles. She incited Ahab in his already rebellious state to God. And if we remember the story continues, this is the story of where Elijah gets all the prophets of Baal and Asher up on the mountain and challenges them. And God comes down and burns up his offering and they can't make things happen. And then Elijah kills 800 prophets that he stood against. And because of that, Jezebel sought to kill him. She actually killed, by influencing her husband, killed all the other prophets of God. Why? Because they would not bow the knee to the idol worship she wanted to force upon God's people. The spirit of Jezebel is very present today. And Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, is even referenced in Revelation where it tells us that the prophetess Jezebel, so this is a spirit of Jezebel, seduces servants to practice sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. So this spirit of Jezebel, which has plagued and been against mankind since the fall, no longer hides in the darkness. It's no longer content to be subtle about drawing people away from God and God's people away from obedience. See, we need spiritual eyes to see the battle because it is going on all around us. These are not political things. They're not cultural things. These are things of the fallen and wicked, fallen and wicked spiritual realm of darkness. As Paul reminds us in Ephesians, our fight is not against other people. We are not in battle against our fellow creation. It is against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is why we're called to be alert with perseverance. See, we're in the middle of a culture that sacrifices the unborn to the idol of personal preference. We have a culture that seeks to find its identity by marring and mutilating the physical body which God created in his image that he called good. We have a culture that no longer holds the institution of marriage in high regard that God created as a union between man and woman to reflect his glory and ultimately Christ's relationship with the church. And sadly, there are people who claim to be part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ who come alongside and encourage, affirm, and support these ungodly things. Compared to what Scripture teaches as faithful obedience, multitudes of Christians are shipwrecking their faith and many times falling away because they love things that are in the world more than they love Jesus Christ. As children of God, we must fully accept there is no part of our lives which stands outside of our relationship with God. We don't get to set aside our confession of surrender when we go to work, hang out with friends, enjoy our recreation, or otherwise engage in any activity that's part of our living in the present world. When God says to be holy because he is holy, he means it. And he means that it should be so at all times. Though we won't be perfect in this endeavor, that in no way gives us the latitude to pick and choose when we'll walk in obedience and give the Lord first place in what we say and we do. I'm going to leave you guys with a few final thoughts. John Piper also said this. If you try to satisfy your longing by sucking in the air of the world, you will not be able to drink the water of heaven. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot fill ourselves with the desires of the world and then try to also hold on to the holiness of God in our hearts. How sad it would be for us as believers to turn 
and to try to gain our satisfaction from heaven or from the world and miss the living water that comes from heaven. Beware the thief that comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He is prowling, looking for those he can devour. He is stealthy. He's in the school system, the library system, every social and worldly system. He's on social media, he's in movies, and he's in music. He's in every worldly medium and pathway that connects to humanity. Why? Because he is the God of this world, of this present age. He will clothe himself in light, and he'll look beautiful and attractive. He will offer the solution that seems to satisfy the longing in the human soul, though in truth it's a lie that brings destruction, which at best steals joy in connection to Christ from believers to at worst drags the unbeliever to hell and eternal separation from the only one who can bring healing, joy, satisfaction, peace, and purpose. When we're confronted with all that the world offers and pushes for acceptance, don't align with it, facilitate it, encourage it, endorse it, promote it, or participate in it. Let us be ready to remain steadfast in faith with a good conscience, immovable in obedience to our new life according to the Spirit of Christ, and unshakable in our resolve to walk in a manner worthy of our calling as God's people. Let us not trust in ourselves, but trust in the power of Christ, lest we risk causing a shipwreck of our faith. Maybe we be willing to say, like the Apostle Paul, we consider all things as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. And for his sake, to suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that we may gain Christ and be found in him. So we're going to have our time of invitation. I know it was short. We're doing communion today. I also was told there's a NASCAR race. I want to make sure nobody hasn't missed the start of that. Driver starts your engines, right? But as we think about this, I don't know what the Spirit might have been communicating to you. I don't know what the Spirit was putting into your heart. Only he knows. The only thing I can ask is always be obedient and responsive to the Spirit of God. So we're going to come. If you have a need, something that you'd like us to pray for, I'll be down front. We've got other elders here. Ken's here. Barney's here. So we're going to have this time of invitation. If you don't know Christ, if you're still under the influence and sway of the world system, now is the time to be surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and come into his kingdom. It's not easy. It's not easy to be a person of God and stand against the world, but let me tell you, it is the only thing that will bring satisfaction that cannot be taken away. It is the only way to walk in truth because God created God sets the order, and he's unchanging. After we get done with our invitation, we'll have our time of communion. So let's just deal, let the Lord deal with us and respond accordingly. Would you stand with me? Open up. Skies of mercy and rain down a cleansing flood, healing waters rise around us and hear our cries, Lord. Let them rise, it's your kindness, Lord. Believe.
us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. And it's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And it's your love. Your love is better than life. open up the skies of mercy and rain down the cleansing flood healing waters rise around us and hear our cries Lord let them rise it's your kindness Lord that leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. And it's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And your love, your love is better than life. We can feel your mercy falling. We're turning our hearts back again. Hear our praises rise to heaven and draw us near, Lord. Meet us here, and it's your kindness, Lord. That leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. And it's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. And your love, your love is better than life. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Lord, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks. Seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. And God, let us be a generation that seeks. Seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Sing that one more time. And give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Lord, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh, God, let us be a generation that seeks. That seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. And, oh, God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh, God of Jacob.